welcome to Dr. Sean Explains. I'm excited to be able to talk to you today about the history of the seatbelt and how we can apply lessons from the widespread usage of seatbelts to the mass fiasco we have today. The safety belt. It needs no introduction. It saves 15,000 lives every year and all of us use it. But did you know it wasn't like that before? Not very long ago when I was young, we didn't use seatbelts. And now that would be unthinkable. Let's go over the history of the seatbelt first, and then we'll talk about the lessons we can learn and how it applies to the current pandemic. In the early 1800s, George Cayley developed gliders, and he had a seatbelt for his glider. This is the first known invention of the seatbelt. In 1949, Nash Motors is the first auto manufacturer to offer a seatbelt. In 1958, Niels Bolin, who worked for Volvo, develops the three-point safety belt, and the next year Volvo sells a car with it. The first car with a three-point safety belt, which is just a lap belt with a shoulder belt. In 1961, Wisconsin becomes the first state to car seat belts in the front seats for new cars. Ford had offered as an option in 1955 and Saab had made a standard in 1958, but it was still optional for most companies. In 1964, all new passenger cars were required to have a seat belt in the front. In 1968, the U.S. requires seatbelts on all vehicles except for buses. In 1983, the U.K. makes seatbelts compulsory. In the U.S. at this time, this was left up to the states. Just for reference, in 1982, the seatbelt usage in the U.S. was 11% for the front seats. In 1984, New York is the first state to pass a seatbelt law. By 1987, 21 states had laws, 1992, 40 states, and by 1995, all of them except for New Hampshire, which still does not have a law for adults, even today. In 1990, the NHTSA initiates a 70% by 92 program, trying to increase the usage of seatbelts to 70% by the end of 1992. In 1990, the seatbelt usage was 49%. In 1993, there was a Click It or Ticket campaign started in North Carolina, and this soon became possible in every state. And today it's 2020, and a seatbelt rate is as high as 90.7% in 2019. It's estimated to save a total of 15,000 lives per year, and we take it for granted that everybody wears a seatbelt. But how long did this take? Let's look at the time frame in a different way. So for technological advances, it took 36 years for the first flight to a jet plane, for the telegraph to the phone call, 38 years, from the PC to the laptop, 8 years. For things that require some more human behavior changes, the smoke detector and widespread adoption was 75% at 94 years, and from an idea of a flush toilet to widespread usage was 255 years. I guess they liked their owl houses back in the day? The mask requirement is something new. How is this related to the seatbelt, which has been around for decades? Well, just like how seatbelts are in the interest of public safety, the government is trying to get people to wear masks also in the interest of saving lives. It's all the same. It's about generally improving the safety of the society. The CDC has now recommended that everybody wears face masks in public. Obviously, there's been a lot of controversy over this requirement. Protests, some armed protesters. There's been even shootings like this one security guard who was shot after he told a customer to wear a mask. As long as a life risk is his own, I believe the individual should decide whether or not the use is wise. What is this talking about? Who is this talking here? Is it a protester today who's talking about my choice about freedom? Well, actually, this is from 1964. Even back in the days, they had a lot of controversy over the idea of a seatbelt. Some said it could cause internal injuries. Some says it could cause you to die because if your car goes into the water, you can't get out in time. Some even said it doesn't need, you don't need it. You already have a door latch for that. And so this was a letter to the Appleton Post Crescent. 
As long as the life risk is his own, I believe the individual should decide whether or not the use of safety belts is wise. Isn't that the same argument they're making today about the use of masks? So I made a list of pros and cons of wearing masks. Pros. Nobody will see the broccoli stuck in your teeth. You don't need to go out and buy another bottle of Listerine when you're out. Nobody can tell that you cut yourself shaving this morning. Cons. It's hard to breathe. Nobody can tell that you spent $3,000 on your teeth. When you talk, it sounds like you're mumbling. But all joking aside, I think the problem is we're not used to it, and it's uncomfortable. You can see here the president of South Africa trying to put on a mask. I bet it'd be a lot more comfortable if he had it around his mouth rather than his eyes. But guess what? Seatbelts were uncomfortable as well. I would complain, hey, I can't breathe. It's choking me. How do I move in this thing? And now they're sexy. How do we affect this culture shift quickly to decrease the deaths from the coronavirus? We don't have 50 years to waste, unlike the seatbelt industry. Well, the answer is easy. Just take the lessons they learn and apply them. Luckily, the NHTSA published a study titled, How States Achieve High Seatbelt Use Rates. We could just take all their hard work and just learn the key points. Easy, right? First, they divided up the states. They looked at the high belt use states versus the low belt use states. They took a survey. Let's see. Do people who don't wear seatbelts have different beliefs? Well, if you look at the red circle numbers, these are the ones where there's a difference in the response between the high and low belt use states. And the green boxes are the ones where there is no difference. So there's no difference whether they use it, whether it's day or night, whether they believe seatbelts can harm you, whether or not they want to have a seatbelt if they get in an accident. They all want to have a seatbelt on if they had an accident. 90% of them do. What is different is how they perceive enforcement. How likely they think they'll get a ticket for not wearing a seatbelt, whether police in the area actually bother to write tickets, whether they should enforce a law, whether they should be more strict with adults, because obviously everybody agrees kids should wear seatbelts. So basically, it's the idea of enforcement. If you look here, yeah, the amount of the fine does matter. Even five bucks makes a difference. But the real key is whether or not the law is primary or secondary. Primary meaning they could pull you over just for a seatbelt violation. Secondary meaning you have to have another reason to be pulled over. And if you go back to the high seatbelt use states versus the low seatbelt use states, you'll find that 13 of the 16 high seatbelt use states had primary belt laws, and only one of the 15 low belt states had a primary law. And obviously the ones with more citations, they had more enforcement, right? They had the same ratio of law enforcement officers, so it wasn't like they had more police there to give tickets. It's just that they had this idea of more enforcement. And it made it so that the perception of people in the low belt use states that they were less likely to get a ticket was actually correct. But you say, what about advertising? You've seen this click it or ticket ad. What about PR, public awareness programs? Well, if you look at this, they also compare this. How much money was spent on click in and ticket media? And guess what? There is no difference. In fact, the low seatbelt use states actually spent more money and it was less effective. So, what's the lesson learned? Well, enforcement should be primary, not secondary. Enforcement, you need more citations because you actually need to increase perception of the risk of getting a ticket so people change their behavior. And without enforcement, PR doesn't actually do anything. And these are actually all the same messages, all the same lessons for mass usage. Right now, we don't actually have real enforcement. There's nobody really handing out citations. People don't think they're going to get a citation. All the publicity in the world doesn't change a thing if there's no law, there's no teeth to the law behind it. So I hope you enjoy my talk on the history of seatbelts how we can apply the lessons learned to the current mass situation for the safety during the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you for listening.